Hello everybody, this is Jason Bosch. Uh, this is going to be the first of, of many videos uh, because what I've done is I've collected a whole bunch of clips from a conference that recent, recently happened on EdTech, Education Technology, uh, from a group called um, uh, the ASU Plus GSV Summit. And this is a partnership between Arizona State University and uh, actually a merchant bank called uh, GSV Global Silicon Valley and they put on this conference every year uh, with different educators and ed tech providers and different different companies uh, that are that it's basically like that are that are changing the the face of, of of education as we know it in in deep and radical ways that are uh, are not being debated or discussed anywhere. Um, so this is not anywhere amongst themselves. They are, but you won't hear about this in, uh, in the media, um, really. But, um, so those of you in the education space, uh, I'm sure are already familiar with, with, with this. Um, they called their conference, the brave new, brave new world. So if, if you guys are familiar with Aldous Huxley, uh, he, wrote a book called brave new world and if the, the story in the brave and brave new world is not a it's not a happy one it's it's a dystopian future so it's kind of odd that they would choose brave new world as their marketing um for their conference so anyways there's that so a little bit about this conference it's um it's it's co-hosted by arizona state university which um is head up by Michael Crow, and um, Michael Crow is who is Michael Crow? Well, he is a um, he's on the board of the uh, Incutel, which if you're not familiar with Incutel, Incutel is a CIA-backed venture capital fund that focuses on technology, and he's also the um, president of ASU. So. Um, Michael Crow at the CIA and venture capital hail ASU's president sees startups shaping the world. So that's who's behind this, uh, the CIA backed funding for ed tech education technology. Anyway, so I have, they have, I actually downloaded probably, well, I downloaded over a hundred videos from their thing and I didn't even download them all. Um, and they're anywhere from 20 minutes to like an hour long. And so I, I start, I've been going through them, grabbing clips and, um, this is going to be real loosey goosey, but I'm just going to, you know, run some clips and, and chat about them. This here is a, uh, their video. I actually muted the volume because, uh, the music will get me, um, a copyright strike. So, um, but yeah, this is, this is their video promoting their, their, um, conference. So they're, they're promoting workforce skills, lifelong learning, education technology, AI. There was a lot of discussion about using AI for um, both for students uh, in their learning and also for teachers in their um, putting together their curriculum and um, virtual reality. Uh, but it's, it's, all, it's all the digitization of, of education. And they also talked a lot about um, wanting to expand education they want everybody everybody everybody's included everybody everybody's in the university you, you, not literally physically but like through your phones and so if you understand you know what they're trying to push in terms of lifelong learning is the idea is that everyone's constantly in this whole game to get credentials and badging and, and, and constantly upskilling throughout their whole life from cradle to grave. Like these, you know, they want you in the system from cradle to grave. And, um, yeah. So, and this ties in with a lot of the, a lot of other aspects of this digital transformation that's happening, um, globally. Um, so the first one, uh, let's see here. So I'll, I'll just finish running this, um, audio less, <laughs> um, I, I, I did clip a couple things out of it cause I was going to share, um, equal ask access to the future. Everybody gets access to the future, um, changing the world for good. Um, so yeah, I've cut the audio out. Let me just jump ahead here. 
Come for the experience, come for the party. <clears throat> so this is the must attend event for education technology investors. ASU GSV is the Davos of education. So that's a good, that's a good way of framing there. And here's, uh, to give you an idea, here's some of the partners supported by the world's best partners, all the best people as, as Kubrick used to put into his films. Um, you have the American student association, ASU, AWS, which is, um, also has CIA links. That's that's Amazon's uh, web web services, and they are also provide services to the CIA. Um, I'm not familiar with Cambium, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, I'm not familiar with Coursera or ETS. Actually, I, I just recently learned about ETS. That's Educational uh, Testing Services, and they've been around since actually 1947. So I, I you know, I, I recently learned about them. And was doing a little digging on that, so that'll be one of the clips. Uh, the, the 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 I have the president of that on one of the clips. Uh, Goldman Sachs. So like, who here wants Goldman Sachs have anything to do with your children's education, um, or or anything to do with anything in your life? <laughs> uh, Go Guardian. There's some of these. Like I said, I've never. I'm not familiar with Kaplan. I'm familiar with you know them. Uh, Walton Family Foundation, Zoom, Stand Together. Uh, Google Cloud. So, anyway, so those are the um, those are the uh, partners. Oh, there's our our buddy. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> he's he's turning out to be a real douche. Uh, what's what's his name? Oh, but Matthew Mc, uh, McConaughey. Yeah, he's. He's a piece of work. <laughs> um, so here is a clip that I do have some audio on um, from that trailer. The goal here is not everybody getting rich. The goal here is everybody doing well while they're doing good. Yeah, so the idea of uh, doing well while doing good is something that came out with this concept of philanthrocapitalism. And EQTEL, you know, who he sits on the board of is, is a nonprofit. So we always hear about public-private public -public partnerships and, um, you know, the, the merging of, you know, corporate and, and state through, through, the, through the partnerships. But there's also the third sector, the nonprofits and NGOs that play a role. And that idea of doing well do, while doing good uh, comes out of that. So I would argue that the economic system, uh, as it was, as it is, and as it's about to be, is and will always be completely incompatible with a just society, a healthy economy, a lot of the values that they profess to be to be serving. Um, you know, they, there's a whole thing. You can't serve two masters and, um, you know, you can't serve the, the master of money a, a, as well as serving these other things. Now, they're trying to sell you that that's actually what they're doing. You know, we figured out a way we figured out a way to, to, to make the environmentalists and the people that are concerned about poverty and the people that are concerned about war. We're going to create peace. Um, you know, we made this all compatible with financial markets, but um, it's actually bullshit. So. So I'll start with this one. This is a um, talk with Pradeep Kosla, who is the chancellor of University of California, San Diego. Uh, Shelly uh, Archambo, uh, she's the board of directors uh, at Verizon, and Michael Crow, who, like I said, is the president um, and a professor of science and technology policy at Arizona State University, which, um, and he's also, uh, the, the chair, I think he's the chair of the board uh, at Incutel, which is a CIA backed um, venture capital fund. So, uh, and this is moderated by Maria and Guay Guayano, Guayano, Guayano. Um, and she's the vice president. Uh, Executive Vice President, Learning Enterprise, Arizona State University. And so, again, I just took out clips. If you want to actually watch the full talk and other talks, it's at their YouTube channel, Global Silicon Valley. So, um, anyways, I'm just going to show some clips and uh, chat about it. And, um, yeah, hopefully we'll... Uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of these. So, I'm just going to just dive in and, and, and just go with it. 
Yeah, I think what, what I would add is that uh, the third part of our charter focuses on the university taking responsibility for outcomes, something universities usually take responsibility for their own outcomes. In our case, we're trying to take responsibility for broader outcomes, including socioeconomic success. That means us performing research at the most intensive intensity that we can, which we do, uh, massive activities, all kinds of things. It means us being a part of, for instance, trying to drive the new uh, semiconductor economy forward in Metro Phoenix, which is taking off in very significant ways, and we're working on that. But it also means us making certain that uh, we're involved in breaking down an old barrier that uh, uh, most universities have stayed away from, which is, are there things that we're doing, things that we have, learning assets that we have, ways in which we can teach, which if we disaggregate it from the academic core of the institution, what we call the academic enterprise of ASU, can you make it available to broader audiences of learners? And so Maria has a team of over 120 people in a startup mode where we're basically designing the functionality of the university to also work as a learning enterprise. Basically, whatever you need, whatever learning asset, learning tool, learning method, learning pathway, anything you need at any point in, in your life, not just when you are a college student, and even if you were unable to be a college student, how do we find a way to just plug people in through various types of devices that allow you, I mean devices in the broadest sense, social devices, technical devices, social system, socio-technical system devices, how do you make all of that happen? Because what we have to find a way to do is to make certain that as UCSD and ASU and other universities build these unbelievable technologies, they will be unbelievably disruptive to the workforce. And if they are unbelievably disruptive to the workforce, then we're going to see additional rises in, in, in resentment uh, towards those that are haves and those that, uh, uh, and that means have access to a great university education, have access to a great engineering degree, et cetera, et cetera. So on the one hand, we've grown engineering from 6,000 students to 30,000 students in the last 10 years. But on the other hand, Maria's assignment is to find a way where we could get a million other learners learning from the same things, but in a completely different way. So, so that's kind of the, the, the way that we're approaching this notion of the new economy. Yeah. So he talks about learning pathways and, you know, we want to be, we want to detach, decouple this, or I don't know how he phrased it, but uh, from the, the traditional university thing, which basically what they're saying is they're, they're expanding it into the digital, into the digital realm. And, and they want to, they want to bring everybody in. They want to bring a large, larger number of people into it and, and have them, you know, anything you need to learn, you, you know, you, you get it through them um, and digitally. Anyway, so they're they're building this 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 new system of of credentialing that has to do with your digital tech. So your your credentialing is going to be you know on your phone and and um, on your your blockchain record that's going to follow you around, and you're 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 going to be excluded. Um, your access is going to be excluded, whether it's a job or otherwise, based on your badges and credential credentialing. That's that's what I think. They're expanding this thing of, of credentialing. Um, okay. Uh, we have seven innovation campuses that we have uh, underway right now. Uh, we've got uh, hundreds and hundreds of interactions that are going on with all of these companies. And then we've launched seven new science and technology centers. The purpose of these centers is to help train new engineers, scientists, uh, conceptualizers, programmers, artists, uh, dreamers, you know, all of these things, but in areas of industry that don't even exist right now. And so we're working on all of these fronts as this new push, this, I mean, if you all are not paying attention to this, the, the Chips and Science Act, the Infrastructure Act, uh, and the last element of the, of the, of the Budget Act that uh, were passed recently, there's more new resources for investment in American competitiveness there than, than since the end of World War II in terms of the concentration. Uh, we just submitted, for instance, a, a $1. billion plus uh, carbon capture technology proposal for a carbon capture technology that we have, a tree that we built, a mechanical chemical tree, to build 10,000 of these trees on a geological formation in New Mexico, capture the carbon, store the carbon, then industrially reuse the carbon, and, and create, helping to create an entire new, entirely new economy. Yeah, so he says there's massive amounts of new money, the largest amount since the end of World War uh, II, uh, being channeled into um, these technologies and these these new uh, um, innovation. You know, they have these all these it's it's always innovation. You know, um, but what is that innovation? Let me jump ahead. 
Verizon is a Series A investor in a new company called Dreams billion dollar plus uh, carbon capture tech, uh, one uh, we just submitted, for instance, a, a one point billion dollar plus uh, carbon capture technology proposal for a carbon capture technology that we have, a tree that we built, a mechanical chemical tree to build 10,000 of these trees on a geological formation in New Mexico, capture the carbon, store the carbon, then industrially reuse the carbon and, and create helping to create an entire new, entirely new economy. So I could probably do a whole show just about that. Um, I've heard about this tree and um, I also know a little bit about, you know, carbon markets, carbon credits, and what an incredible scam that is. So I should probably dig deeper into that one. But the idea of a, a mechanical chemical, you know, they want to build a whole bunch of mechanical chemical trees. So I, I mean, anyone that I know that's an environmentalist, uh, I, I don't understand how, how anybody that genuinely cares about ecology and the planet would think this is a good idea, that, that you know, the, the solution is to build a bunch of carbon chemical trees. The solution is to build a whole bunch of more data centers so we can collect more data and to put sensors on everything, which involves massive amounts of energy use and mining and, and the such. So, but because all of this has to protect, you know, the economic structure, but also um, may have alter, may have other motives that people aren't really aware of in terms of steering us into into uh, some kind of cybernetic system for for some other purpose. So, anyways, I thought that was kind of interesting. The the mechanical chemical tree. I think the likelihood that EdTech would replace the traditional four-year residential education is zero. I agree with that. You uh, might reduce it a little bit, uh, but you will not replace the traditional four-year education. And I think this is the mental block that people in Silicon Valley uh, need to get over. I mean, it's not going to disrupt. Universities are not going away. Trust me, we are here to stay. <laughs> Right, but we will change, and I think all, all that everything that you guys are doing will force us and put us in the in the right direction. So that's a good thing. Yeah, can I just add to that? I agree that universities are here to stay. I do believe that it is competitive in terms of what we're seeing, and I think it's being driven by the fundamental gap we just talked about: workforce readiness. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to solve that. You know, there's initiatives underway at companies to actually reduce the number or reclassify jobs, if you will to eliminate the college education requirement. I mean, IBM has reclassified almost 40% of their jobs. So this is a real initiative. And what they're doing instead is certificate programs, right? Alternate, they're either offering or they're partnering with companies in terms of creating, et cetera. They're doing it because they see a problem and a gap. Right. What I believe is we're gonna see, again, this competition is great because universities, who are the experts actually in how to educate at scale, et cetera, I see partnerships coming. I think universities will change and evolve. I do think we'll see fewer universities. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going away. I think we'll see the ones that are innovative, adaptable, and actually partnering in the marketplace. They're gonna thrive, they're gonna grow, and they're gonna expand. But I do think that there will be some that actually won't, won't make it because they won't be adaptable, but they won't be changing. The needs are evolving, but I see the competition is actually a good thing. It's like anything else, you see a problem, a gap starts to be filled, then the experts who actually know how to take it, scale it, grow it, right? They take that and move forward, and I think that's what universities so will do. So I have an observation there, so I think you're right. The unfortunate part is, scale may be important for IT industry in Silicon Valley, not necessarily good for universities. A lot of universities that are going away are small, boutique liberal arts institutions. And there is a class of students. Michael talked about the way you want to learn, the way you can learn, the way you should learn. There is a class of students for whom these universities are important and they're all going away because they don't have the scale. They cannot uh, be charging 70,000 tuition and have only 2,000 students and pay the faculty, right? So that's the unfortunate part. I think this is where you can help, where you can allow these smaller institutions to be in business while offering similar quality education at lower price points because of the technology and ed tech. And I think we are not seeing that at all. We are seeing that in large institutions like ours, but not in small liberal arts institutions. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of an interesting um, back and forth. You know, first she was saying that they're not going away, and then she was like, well, actually, <laughs> a lot of them are going away. Um, 
yeah and, and which is what what we're what we're talking about is a consolidation you know you're you, you see everything all sorts of vis, di different businesses kind of you know monopolizing and that's what that's what happens you know when the smaller smaller businesses die out so um probably I, i'm very critical of the university system but i imagine the the better education in terms of actually people's ability to think are coming from the smaller universities rather than the large ones. Um, that's now the better education in terms of your ability to get a job, not necessarily, but um, yeah, but that's, that's tragic that, you know, they're, they're openly saying that these, these smaller universities are, are, are all going away. And, um, and again, like they're, but but at the same time they're going to be expanding the student base dramatically through ed tech through the through the digital technology so with the tools that we have we have 65,000 K12 learners taking advantage of the same technologies that we never could have reached before in the way that we're operating so that was an interesting thing there too like with the tools that we have uh, we're able to reach we're, we're able to reach a lot more more people in the k through 12 and the and the partnerships that they have with these other companies um and, and i think that's again we're, we're we're talking about someone who's who's being funded um and and represented um I'm sorry. We're talking about someone who's who's representing CIA funding. So think about that as as we listen to this, and they they want to pull everyone into this education system. So I think the way that you know the way that they're going to manage people is through health, through education, um, and and work, and other things. I'm sure I'm missing something. You know, a lot of what drives the strategies at both universities is that they are actually trying to be inclusive of as many people and reach as many people and provide access to as many people. Um, I do think we're gonna see some interesting dynamics because most universities focus on being exclusive. Mm -hmm. Exclusive, and by definition, when you're exclusive, you are restrictive, right? You are limited, you are not scaled, you are. And so there's a whole dynamic here that I really encourage everyone, whether you're coming at it from the business standpoint or the education standpoint, to really think about, but inclusivity it's not just one of who, but it's the reach we had on stage, right? Africa, what's happening around the world. I just think education in general and the way we need to think about it, if we think about it as inclusive and reach and scale, we're gonna see so much more in terms of innovation, impact and outcome effect. Yeah, innovation, impact and outcome effect. And again, they wanna reach everybody. They want everybody in that system. You know, that's, that's just a part of your, your, your life there. Um, lifelong, there's another talk where, I have, where they talk about this idea of lifelong learning. And uh, most people are unaware that this is, uh, you know, this is being planned. I mean, not necessarily for, you know, obviously my generation, uh, next generation, you know, that, that are coming up, young kids, and then the generation after that, they're going to be living in an entirely different experience. And it's not going to be a healthy one in my, in my view. Undergraduate education should be egalitarian. It should be a satisfying strategy where anybody who's capable of doing coursework at UC San Diego should be allowed to be admitted and do it. And there's no two ways about this. To say that I'm only gonna pick the best and the rest are gonna be left behind is a disaster for the economy. So that's undergrad only, that's undergrad. If you think about PhD education, there you should pick the best of the best because now you're talking about building new knowledge, creating new knowledge, and you gotta work with the best. And you should pick the best of the best from all over the world, not just from California, not just from uh, the US. There's no way to do this, however. Do this, however, unless you... There's no way to do this, however, unless you use technology that allows you to be able to, to scale. And so we admit every single student who meets those qualifications and have to be prepared in one way or another, either online or on campus, to take them and to help them to be able to be successful at that undergraduate level. Yeah, so that was just an introduction for this series that I'm going to be doing. I have, I already have lots of clips pulled out. I'm still pulling clips, and um, uh, I'm not an expert um, on on an education, but I know a little bit. But if, if you're listening, you have you have, you have thoughts or comments, feel free to leave them below um, related to this. So uh, I would love to hear you know what you guys think about all this. So thanks again, and uh, I'll have more coming out soon.